day two of the Cowboys. And our thought question to start out with today, because we're reviewing for your test, is uh, as a group, could you come up with the different positions on the cattle drive? So let's see if you can do it here. So like I said, you always want to think of it kind of like a, like an arrow, right? That's our cattle. Whoa. That was weird. Okay, so there's our cattle. All right, so what's in front? Trail boss. What else is in front? Chuck wagon. And the cookie, right? Good. Okay, then in the front of the cattle drive, where, where else do we have? Point, the point of the arrow, good. And point, okay, what's next? Okay, so we got Wrangler and Bermuda. Jar horses, good. And let's do this color next. Okay, who's next on the cattle drive behind point? Swing, good. Like we said, that's one of the toughest jobs because they have to like squeeze in and make sure that these cattle right here aren't trying to go off on their own. So they have to really push in in those corners. Who's after them? Good, think of the flanks of the animal, the slot, the side, right? And who's in back? Drag, good. Good, look at that, you ace that. That's awesome. All right. Okay, so to start out our notes today, uh, we are going to play a song for you. I'm gonna play an old song by a guy named Gene Autry who was really famous with the old cowboys. Um, and it's a song you might have heard called Back in the Saddle Again. As I play it, I want you to really look at the lyrics and see how they apply to what you've learned so far, okay? At home, I'm sorry, I can't do this. It makes it all garbled. Okay, so now in the video, I showed you some of the old westerns. Notice a lot of them were done in black and white in those days. Um, what's really kind of neat is, remember, we're talking like the 1890s, the cowboy era was. So, for example, when people like Wyatt Earp died, it was in the 1940s and 50s, a lot of them. So people like um, Gene Autry and those guys, they actually were pallbearers for some of the real cowboys of the 1890s. So they definitely have a connection, which is kind of cool. So as a class, give me three things that you saw in here that you've learned from class that you connected to this song. Give me one, Roman. That they use their gun for what? Yeah, for need, right? To protect themselves. It's not a gunslinger, but they use it to um, get rustlers, Indians, snakes, but it's for survival, right? Good. Give me another one. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, they were very friendly to other cattle, cattle outfits, and they'd help them out. Good. Give me one more. Slept out all night, yeah. Don't get to go to sleep like we do, right? Unless we got homework later. So, yeah, it really applies to kind of some of the stuff we've been talking about. So now what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about a little bit of extra stuff. That's why I was all mixed up yesterday. We're going to talk about cattle roping. So let me see if I can find it here. There we go. And those of you at home, you're sure missing it right now because I have a rope in my hand. And we're gonna rope one of your classmates right now. Okay. Now are any of you good at roping? Any of you, that, Heather's good at this. Okay. So I'm gonna have her help me in just a minute here. Now there's a couple of things that I don't, I know that this isn't like a blank on your notes. So what you're going to do on the very back or on the end or wherever you have room. Oh, yeah, we got room on the back. I want you to draw what we're explaining here. All right? So we are going to bust a herd quitter. In other words, an animal that has decided to go off on its own. It's quit the herd. And we got to make sure to grab them. Because remember what I told you yesterday? If an animal dies or gets lost, what happens to your paycheck? Goes down. Goes down because they subtract any animal that you lose. So you don't want to lose any animals. So if an animal strays from the pack, um, realize that it can also be dangerous. They might be headed toward a cliff or mud where they might break a leg. So you've got to grab them and get them back in with the group as much as possible. So 
we're going to talk about if you're by yourself on this mission, then you would just have what we call a header, okay? And the header is the person that gets the head of the animal. Makes sense? That's the name header. So you're going to draw a guy on a horse. You can do stick people. That's fine. And you're going to draw either a horse or a calf that's running off on its own. Oh, you can just make it, you know, inch or inch and a half big, whatever. We're going to show you one more thing after this. And when we have Western Day, you'll all get to throw the rope at a target, actually. Okay, so you'll all get the chance here. Okay, but generally, here's the way things work. Okay, here's the news, right, of the, of the rope. And you want to keep that somewhat large because you want to be able to go around the target and then tighten, right? And you'll see it's got this little, what do you call that? Another noose? I don't know. A needle hole. Okay. You've got that little needle hole. And you basically hold that with your throwing hand. The other hand holds the extra of the rope. And you want to hold this with your left hand, my left hand, kind of easily. Because as you throw it, it's going to extend, and you want it to be able to release, right? Okay. So, Heather, come on up here. You're going to be the header. Toby, will you be our calf? Come on up. Okay. Get down on your hands and knees there, Toby. All right. So we're going to have you go over here, Heather. And we won't do it for real because it actually hurts if you hit them with it hard. So, okay. So what you would normally do is you do this around your head. And I don't want to hit anybody with the ceiling. And then you throw it, right? So you're going to put this, hold that. Go put it around his head and his horns. That's your target. So go ahead and put that around his head and his horns. And as soon as it goes around the target, then you pull back. And you'll notice that the noose will tighten, right? Right? And she tightens. Now, what's amazing about these, what's that? What's amazing about these animals is these horses are so well trained. And if you watch it in a rodeo, it's awesome. They have been trained that is immediately after this happens, horses trained the exact opposite way. So they're going towards the animal that's running. And as soon as the noose tightens, they back up so that it tightens that rope and they hold this nice and taut, okay? And of course, then you try to grab them and pull them back to wherever you gotta go, okay? That's the header, but it doesn't stop there. Okay, stay there, header. You stay there too, calf. So now if there's two of you, we have a header and a healer, yes. We have a header and a healer. So I'm going to have you come over here, Heather. And Toby, you're going to be facing that way. So come right here. Okay, and who would like to be my healer? Come on up, James. So I'm going to have you go here. And he's going to go here. Now, they're called the header and the healer again for obvious reasons. The header is getting the head of the animal. The healer is getting the heels of the animal. So come right over here. All right. So as this calf is going on his way, they're riding on their horse. Catching up with them. As she goes by, and this happens simultaneously, she, hold your rope, hold your rope, okay? She ropes the head, go, and goes that direction, goes right past him. As you go, she goes right past him. Now, at the same time that she ropes the head, he takes his rope and, would you believe, throws under the feet and catches the back legs. Can you imagine how hard that would be? So he catches the back legs, pretend. Okay, and then his horse goes this way, right. and you're pulling tight that way. So imagine, okay, put this on his head here. Put your arm here. Okay, just go like that. Okay, now you pull there, and imagine I pull here. Put your hands down, or I'm gonna hurt you. And what happens? Oh, it stretches the animal out, right? Because she's pulling the head, he's pulling the heels back. A lot of times, this is how they will do branding of cattle because they have to get them down on the ground and hold them down. So they will have a header and a healer. The horses and their cowboys will hold them taut so they're stretched out, and then the other cowboys will come down then and brand the animal. So it is quite a process. Now, I remind you, thank you guys, give them a hand. Lovely. 
So here's just a few of your notes. You can set them over there, Heather. Thank you, honey. The horses run alongside the animal in this case, right? Because the animal is running. Uh, the header ropes the horns. The healer ropes the back feet of the calf. And then, again, those horses immediately reverse directions and they pull. They pull opposite ways. Now, the thing that I find amazing about this is we did this while he was sitting right there. But remember that all three animals are moving while you're doing this. And imagine, like, imagine someone running in front of you and trying to throw a rope to catch their feet as they're running. It's hard. So sometimes you'll catch, like, maybe one foot, uh, which can be dangerous. It can break a leg. So it's not an easy task for sure. So that's calf roping. All right. Okay, so let's go to where we left off here. We were talking about the cowboy outfit, weren't we? Yes, we were. We had just ended with the vest and the slicker, remember that? Okay. So now let's talk about the chaps. So these were the first kinds of chaps that people wore. They were called shotguns. That was the name of this style. They obviously were worn for an obvious reason. It protects the legs from brush, rope burns, and horse bites. Heather, you ever been bitten by a horse? Yeah. Hurts like a son of a gun, right? Yeah. You thought I was going to say something else. But at the time, you probably would have said that other word. Yeah. Hurts really bad. So it protects your legs from all that stuff. And remember, this rope is not nice. And you're using it all day long or all night long as you're out on the, on the horse. So this itself gets rubbing. And it's awesome. Sure. I can pass that out. You want to feel it? Sure. Student gave that to me a few years ago. Um, now, these can be made out of suede or leather so that they are hardy in the weather and all that fun stuff. But there is a drawback to this particular brand. The problem, you had to pull them on like you put on jeans. And when you're out in the outside, cowboys don't want to take off their boots. And they had to actually take off their boots to put these on, which was a pain in the butt. Because again, remember, we've got rattlesnakes and all that stuff going on. So they said, oh, I don't really like those shotguns a whole lot. So they went to this next brand. They went to bat wings. And you can see why they call them bat wings, because they kind of wing out, don't they? They got wingy sides. Now the benefits, typically these are an even tougher material. Um, they're definitely made out of, out of uh, well, I wouldn't even say suede. I would say leather, for sure, um, calf skin, stuff like that. But you want them a little bit thicker. And again, it's to protect you from the brush and the rope burn and stuff like that. And the nice thing about these is you don't have to take off your boots. Because what happens is right alongside here, so we'll have little attachments. You know, nowadays it's what? Buttons? Hooks? Okay, so they've got zippers and ties today. Back then they would have little ties or little buttons that you would button down the side. So you could just put those on any old way. You can see over here, here's an example of the back. Yep. You see the ties here? Okay. And there's one more kind. These are called woolies. And you can imagine why. Because they're woolly, right? Most often you would find these around here. Why do you think that's so? Because it's, it's freaking cold here. <laughs> yeah. So it's to help protect the legs, but it also keeps you warm. So they would use sheep's fur, animal fur, bear fur, you name it, anything that would keep them warm. Okay. All right, so let's talk about cowboy boots next. Man, besides the cowboy hat, cowboy boots are probably the next most important thing, right? Um, I don't know if you know this, but boots kind of went through a progression. So the very first boots actually came from the Civil War. Let me get these out of the way. The Civil War boots... Looks something like if you have a pair of ropers, anybody? Anybody have ropers? Great boots to wear because they're good for work. They're not fancy. You can wear them and get them dirty. They're comfortable. Okay. Notice they're very simple. They have a low heel and they have a rounded toe. Very simple and very easy to wear. Okay. That was the first boot with the Civil War. Uh, does anybody know what soldiers in the Civil War wore boots? The officers, yes. The cavalry, the officers wore boots. The other guys didn't. They were lucky to have shoes. Okay? Then we went to phase two, and they did added a cowboy heel. 
It looked a little something like this. Okay. Then we got a little bit more intricate. And they realized that they couldn't get these suckers on very easily because they're tough, right? So they added mule ears. These are mule ears right here. The things you use to pull them on with, right? To pull them on. Those are called mule ears. They also added a pointed toe to the boot. This one's not real pointed, but it gives you the idea anyway. And nowadays, holy cow, you can find cowboy boots of any color, any size, any brand, any anything. They can be made out of snake skin, bear, whatever, I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff. And you'll see a lot more accents. You'll see the really pointed toe, all kinds of different heels. Um, look, at we've even got roses and crosses and... And I just ordered a pair that has um, turquoise crosses on it. It's really cool. So lots of fun stuff. So it's really progressed through the time. So let's talk about a spur. So let's go basic, because a lot of people are cowboys any day. Nowadays, or farm people even. Where does a spur go? On the back of, the of your boot. On the back of your boot, like this. This is just a baby one. It's a pretend one. It's a toy one. Okay, so it goes on the back of the boot. Now, who can tell me what is it used for? The horse to make it go. Yeah, you kick the horse with it to make it go. Now, you have to have, there's a fine line between being cruel to your horse and yet being boss of your horse. You have to show them that you're in control in the situation, but if you kick them too much, they're going to rebel and hate you too. So if you read about the cowboys, they'll tell you you have to be careful about how much you use your spurs. Okay, so if you didn't know, there are actually parts to a spur. So let's talk about the parts of a spur. All right, first of all, this is your spur strap. Like I said, this is a fake one, so it's nothing fancy. But normally there would be a strap that would come across like this to hold it on your boot so it doesn't fall off. And this would be the spur button right over here. This is the heel band right here. That's this thing, the thing that goes around the heel. That's the shank, the thing that brings it out, okay? And over here you have the rowel. That's this little thing right there, okay? And sometimes you'll even have jingle bobs. I didn't know that was a real word, but we have jingle bobs. Yes, we do. To make sound. So it clinks. Well, you think even when I walk with this, well, I won't do it now, but like it makes noise. And cowboys like the fact that it kind of made noise as you walked. So if you had jingle bobs, it has a little more of that to it. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at the styles of spur. We already talked about what it's used for, so make sure you know that, of course. So our first one that most cowboys used, to be honest with you, was a work spur. And it's a lot like the one you see right here. Uh, it typically has kind of a star on the back. Very simple, because you're in the mud and the poop, and it gets dirty. So that's what you would use typically. That's a work spur. But you'll see a lot of these were named after events of the time period or styles. The other one that was very common was the OK Corral spur. And you'll see that has a little more, um, a, I don't know, the star has more points on it, I guess you might say, named after the shootout at the OK Corral, which we'll be studying once we get done with these. Okay. And if you really were going fancy, now this would typically be worn when you were going to meet the ladies, going to a rodeo, anytime that you're trying to show off a little bit, they might have a Spanish colonial. And notice the Spanish influence that we have all this lovely intricate work. Okay, that comes from Mexico and Spain, of course. And if you really got fancy, you could spend 500 to 1,000 bucks on these. Uh, some of these are made of gold and bronze. We see turquoise names done into them. Um, this is also another Spanish colonial that has gold etching in it. So a lot of people that um, do really well in rodeos, they might get these as an honorable thing for what they've done. But most of the time, our real cowboys wore these first two. That was very common. Okay. All right, let's talk about gauntlets. Anybody know where do you see gauntlets today? They're not very common. What? Marching band. Yeah, the directors in a marching band will sometimes wear gauntlets. These are the gloves. Now you'll notice that these are made out of suede or leather. Um, it was again used to fight off rope burns and blisters by the reins. 
But I will tell you, based on the real cowboys, they would tell you that a real cowboy didn't wear gauntlets because he said it robbed you of a feel of the rope because you can imagine how gloves get in the way and you can't feel where the rope's going or where it's coming. So he would not have done that. That would have not been a manly thing to him. That would have been um, a rookie mistake to him. Okay. All right, so let's talk about a couple of things. I know that there's a pizza named it right over here, Pizza Ranch. We have a roundup, right? Well, it was actually an event in the Old West. This was where the cowboys would count the results of spring calving, see how many they have, brand the young calves, cut their ears for identification, and doctor any of the sick ones. Because remember, they're out on the plains, right? So now you're bringing them in and you're looking at all that stuff. This is usually when you got to the cow towns. You're figuring all that stuff out, okay? Uh, and you'll see up here, here's them branding the animal. And you see how they've got the ropes taut, like we talked about here and here. So they're holding them stretched out while they're getting branded. Now, I imagine that's not a very fun thing, right? So why did they brand them? Why do they brand them? Yeah, because if one gets out of your pen or gets loose, you want to be able to say, this is my calf, right? So you brand it with your insignia, and you'll see some of those down here. So like, um, this might be the insignia of my particular ranch, the 4F ranch, okay? Well, rustlers got really good at this because that's why they were branding in the first place, because they were stealing their cattle. So rustlers would learn how to adjust brands. So for example, let's say that, that um, I stole this from the 4F ranch, all I'd have to do is go like this, this, and this, and this, and all of a sudden it becomes a different symbol. Oh, that's my ranch. It's not yours. It's not for us. I didn't steal it from you. So they would actually rebrand the animal with little fix-its and try to make it their own so that no one could accuse them. Because remember, if you steal a calf or a horse, what happens? You get hung, right? So you didn't want to get caught. Well, here's what happened. During these roundups in the cow towns up in Dodge City and whatnot, uh, cowboys would get together and they would start popping off to each other. Because remember, these guys are drinking. They're like, oh, I'm a better roper than you, man. I bet I can rope a calf in five seconds. And he's drunk and he's like, oh, I bet I can rope a calf in three seconds. So they would compete. And he would try and I would try and then, oh, yeah. Sorry, I lost. I'll give you my $1 or whatever I bet, okay? And they would do that kind of stuff. And they would say, oh, this bronc, nobody can ride this bronc. This horse is mean. It is so mean. I bet, Riley, that I can ride that sucker for five seconds. He's like, oh, I can ride it for 10. I can ride it for 10. So again, we get out there in front of our cowboys just as a fun little bet. I bet you five bucks. And then whoever won would win the bet. But well, what happened is these people around the area would hear about this crazy shenanigan, and then they would start to come and watch when the cattle came in. And pretty soon, they realized they could make money on the deal. So they started charging admission to this event, and pretty soon they called it a rodeo. And that's how rodeo came to be. And nowadays, holy cow, it's a totally different ballgame. We went from uh, that to things like this, or this, or this, lots and lots of fun. And these are professional rodeoers, right? That's what they do for a job, that is their job. And you're on TV, right? Like when we lived down in Dallas and Fort Worth, holy cow, it was a big deal. And it was on TV every weekend. They make some big bucks on the deal, so. So rodeo started with people betting, and it got to be a much larger issue. So let's talk about what happened. Why did it end? One of your written questions on the test. The cowboy era very much lasted a little amount of time. It's only about 20 years, from 1866 to 1888. Why? Two reasons. The first reason is the invention of barbed wire. Does anybody know who invented barbed wire? Starts with G. Mr. Glidden invented barbed wire. 
So what started to happen is, especially up north here, we had people that wanted to put a fence around their territory because this is my land, my plot of land, right? So they would put barbed wire around their territory. Well, remember, they have been driving people all the way from Texas, all the way up to North Dakota, and it was open. So now what was happening is they were having to ask permission. Can I go across your fenced area to go up north? And they would say either yes or no. If they said no, you had to go around. It was getting to be real pain. But they still kept going. Here's what really ended it. A blizzard. In the year 1886, it was the largest blizzard in history struck, and it struck fast and hard. Now, typically, cattle have an instinct. They know when a storm is coming. You know what I'm talking about, Heather? They can feel it. They start to get agitated, and they will naturally go away from the storm if you let them. But the problem is there were all these fences, and they couldn't get away. So they got stuck along the fence line, and they kept trying to go and trying to go, and they couldn't get away. It got so cold and so bad that it froze their nostrils shut and they suffocated to death. And so in the, the spring, they found stacks, like six, eight high of cattle bodies, you know, dead bodies everywhere. And it busted all the ranchers. All the guys down in Texas went broke because all their cattle died in this particular blizzard and that ended the cattle drive. That was the end. Isn't that sad? Wow. So on your test, you're gonna give me two answers. Barbed wire and a blizzard. Okay. Sad, sad. Now, is this the end of our notes? Oh, no, because we haven't talked about the gunfighters yet and the lawmen. So let's talk about them a little bit. This was the cowboys. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to give you the last fact there. Millions of cattle and buffalo died. Their nostrils froze. They suffocated to death. And the cattle barons went bankrupt down in Texas. No more cattle drive. And if you look at it now, is there really a lot of land that is just totally open? Maybe West River a little bit, but out here it's all kind of fenced away, isn't it? Farming land is all fenced away. In fact, I'll play you a song tomorrow about how farmers and, and cattle cowboys hate each other. So if the cowboy era lasted only for 20 years, then why is it still popular today? We have cowboy music, we wear cowboy boots, we have rodeos, we have westerns. Why is it popular? Why did it keep going? Here's why. This right here. Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, where you could see live Indians, cattle rustling, gun slinging, and everything. So what happened is uh, Buffalo Bill would hire these great people from the West, and he would actually make it into a show. It's kind of like a traveling circus. And he would come around, and everybody would go to the show and see all the sights. And it kept this thing alive, and people loved it. In fact, I think we'd still like it today. It's a really cool show. Here's what it entailed. Uh, it glamorized it. It featured sharpshooters like Miss Annie Oakley. I know one of you in here at Annie Oakley, right? Okay. It was said that she could shoot a playing card. If you threw it in the air, she could shoot a playing card three times before it hit the ground. She could also hit a quarter three times before it hit the ground. Pretty good. Pretty accurate and pretty fast. Um, they would even act out events like Little Big Horn or Wounded Knee. And sadly, as you saw in the movie, they hired real Indian braves. So people on the reservation, of course, weren't they were starving. So they would hire them to come and act as themselves and go through Wounded Knee again. How fun was that, right? Because they're slaughtering them. And of course, when the Indians would come out, the audience would boo and spit at them and throw stuff at them. And then when the, the soldiers would come in, the 7th Cavalry would come in, they'd come in shooting on their horses, and everybody would applaud because they were the good guys. And again, that's also why for years we didn't know what really happened at some of these events because that's the way it was portrayed in these shows. So it was really sad when you look at people like Sitting Bull, who was a great warrior, ended up being in this kind of an event. Uh, they had all kinds of fancy riding, ropes, and all that fun stuff. So it's kind of like a rodeo only expanded. So let's talk about some of these famous people from this era. Let's talk about the gunfighters. <clears throat> all right, first of all, there's a difference. That's your guy, Johnny Ringo. Now a gunman was an outlaw who preferred to shoot up close and unload, and he relied on his speed. 
So he was really, really fast with his hands. That was his goal. And then when he practiced two, three times a day, that's what he was practicing was his speed. Because you don't have to really aim a whole lot if we're this close, right? Okay? So that's what he's focusing on. Someone like Johnny Ringo. A gunfighter, however, was that aloof peace officer like Wider, who usually did not shoot first because it's illegal to shoot first, right? Because he's a lawman. You don't shoot until you've been shot at, right? Just like policemen, okay? So he would not shoot first, but he would shoot back, and he'd better dang well hit the mark. So he practiced accuracy because he had to make sure he hit that mark because if they've got a shot off, he's got to hit that target. So you'll see it will actually lead them to using different kinds of guns in this case. What'd you say, Ryan? Uh, the, the gunman might. Yes, yes. Yeah, we'll talk about that, actually. We're going to show you that in a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about our gunfighters a little bit. All right, now remember that a gunman practiced daily. Think of that person like an Olympic athlete today. It was their livelihood, and it was their life. They didn't do anything else except maybe drink and sleep with women. I mean, that was their livelihood. Because um, how many of you, let's see, who's in basketball here? Girls and guys. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Brandon, how many hours a day do you practice basketball when you're in season? Three hours a day. And then in the summer, you're shooting hoops, right? In the off season, all that stuff, right? Okay. Now imagine if come this November, the first game that you're going to play is usually against who? Harrisburg, okay? Imagine the game against Harrisburg. Whoever loses gets lined up on the end line and gets shot. <laughs> yeah, now that would change your focus and practice, would it not? <laughs> I would hope it would, because you don't want to lose, right? Because if you lose, you're dead. It isn't like a regular football game or something where, whoa, whoa, we lost, we get to go home. This is bad. You lose, you die. So you had to be good. So they practiced all the time, at least two, three hours a day. Um, the sad part is the gun didn't always do what it was supposed to because these were not guns like we have today. So the gun didn't always go off when they were trying to shoot. So, for example, how many of you have been out in Deadwood, South Dakota? You've been to the saloon? What is it called? Number 10 saloon? Is that what it's called? Yeah, Did they change it? Where he was shot? Well, this is where, remember, Wild Bill Hickok was shot? Well, did you know the pistol that Jack McCall used to kill Hickok in Deadwood misfired on every shot except the one to Hickok? So, sad for Hickok, but yeah, in his case, it did not work. Uh, actually, who has Hickok in here? She's going to tell you all about it when we're done with these. So she'll tell you. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about their guns a little bit. Let me get my gun. Okay. All right. Now, generally, a wearer carried, um, usually uh, your gunman used like a Colt 45, typically. Colt was a really big brand then. It still is today. Uh, they would carry... Uh, five loaded cartridges in the gun. Because remember, in a real gun, this little barrel right here comes out, right? And you put your bullets in there. Now, it's called a six-shooter for a reason. Why? Because it has six shots. So why do you suppose they only put five bullets in? So, yeah, safety. Because if it's in my holster right here and I bump it, it could go off and shoot me in the foot. So you always had your gun on an empty to begin with, and then you had five bullets in. So, or you could, but typically they would only have five. So when you see these movies where they have like a million bullets at a time, very inaccurate, they usually had five, okay? And that's why they would keep it down on an empty. They would shoot at an inanimate object and then a moving object, but just to give you an idea of how fast these guys were, they could shoot at an inanimate ob object and get five shots off of his gun in somewhere around one second. Now, remember, these are not automatics like we have today, right? I can't just go like that. I have to cock the gun before every shot, right? So who wants to see if they can do it? 
Right? Come on up. Okay? You want to be his target? Lucky <laughs> you. You can stand over here. Okay. Now here's what we're going to do. All right? Brady, you're going to count. When I say ready, go, you're going to go 1,001. That's all you got to do. Okay? You three over here, you are going to count exactly how many shots he gets off. Now remember, you have to cock the gun before each bullet. Wait, so I can't fan the hammer? Nope. Ah. Oh. You have to shoot five shots. Try to get five shots off in one second. Let's see how many you can get. Ready? I'll say on your marks, get set, go. Okay, ready? On your marks, get set, go. Oh, no, you can use your other hand. They learned that you could cock the hammer with oh, this. Okay. Yeah. Okay, ready? On your marks, get set, go. How many? Three. Three? Okay, we'll give him one more shot. Ready? On your mark, get set, go. How many did you get? Yeah. So did he get all five? No. Were they all accurate? No. <laughs> it's amazing, right? They were very, very fast. Very fast. But again, it's because they practiced two, three hours a day. If you practice two hours a day, I know you'd be just that. That's probably true. Yeah, they probably blow up, actually. Now, lawmen tended to do a peacekeeper like this. I can, well, I guess I can. Can I? It's still recording, right? Okay, we'll try that. Okay, so um, lawmakers usually used a peacekeeper like this. They went to a longer barrel because, remember, what is the goal of a lawman? Not to be fast, but to be... Accurate. Remember, they don't shoot first, but they got to make sure they're accurate. Well, the longer the barrel, the more it guides the bullet and the more accurate it is, right? So that's why they had a little longer barrel. A normal one would have been about, I'd say about that long. I don't have one to show you, but okay. Um, now, they went to this for other reasons as well. Number one, you know how you have backfire on your guns when you hunt? This doesn't jump back quite as much, okay? Plus, as we said, it guides the bullet, so it provides better aim, too. Okay? So that's why they use different guns. Okay, here we go. All right, so let's talk about holsters. Holsters changed a lot in the 1890s. Okay, because if you look at our Civil War soldier here, their holsters look a little funky. First of all, look at how tiny they are down here on the bottom, right? Now, after the Civil War, the Army carried its revolvers in a flap-top holster. So notice they would actually have had a little flap up here that would come over the gun and snap. So imagine having to unsnap the holster and get your gun out. It would be very slow. And you want to be fast because you're a gunman, right? So they had to get rid of that. The other thing that they did is they would actually carry the, the gun with the butts to the front, like this. This is the butt of the gun. So they would carry this to the front. So imagine, okay, if I'm right-handed, my gun is like this, having to pull it out, flip it, and shoot. It was again slow because a fraction of a second means life or death. So they changed things. Let's see what happens. Um, the other thing that they did, it was they actually used um, their holster. It was actually a regular belt that they kept their pants up with originally. And it was held right around the waist. Just like this. Okay? So it was waist high. Do you see a problem with this? So if I'm trying to be fast, right? I gotta get all the way up here, pull my gun out, and try to try to shoot slow again. It's not as, as fast. So we're trying to cheat any way we can to get that fraction of a second. So the first thing that they did is they loosened their belt so that it was closer to the shooting hand. So instead of being at the waist, we'd have it down here so that it's at right where my hand sits so that I can pick up that gun and shoot. You see that here? So this is down. See the belt? It's down towards his hand. So it's quicker. He can grab it faster. They also tried a shoulder holster that you see on Doc Holliday over here. Um, but it was not typically used for a shootout um, or like, you know, a, a standoff. Most of the time, that was just used if you needed an extra gun in an, in, in an emergency. 
because again, that's really hard to pull that out, okay? Now, I found this and I thought it was really interesting because it tells you how a gunfighter thought. This is called the gunfighter's prayer. Listen to what they're saying. Lord, make me fast and accurate. Let my aim be true in my hand faster than those who seek to destroy me. Grant me victory over my foes and those who wish to harm me and mine. Let not my last thought be, if only I had a gun. And Lord, if today is truly the day you call me home, let me die in a pile of brass. What do they mean by dying in a pile of brass? Yeah, with bullets all around me. Me and I have given them every last bullet that I have before I'm killed and I go down. Okay? Kind of cool. And you know what? When I read this, it helps me understand why states like South Dakota say, Obama, you can't take my gun. It is my right to protect myself. These are those old West guys that we're talking about. West River, they're cowboys. They've been cowboys since the 1890s. And that's their belief system, man. You don't take my gun. Okay? So I get it a little bit. Now let's talk about another technique they use called the cross draw. In the cross draw, here's what happens. So instead of being like a normal holster, you're going to actually have the butt of the gun to the front like the Civil War did. I didn't flip my holsters, but basically so it's going to be like this. Okay? This was typically only used in the Midwest for a really obvious reason. What do you think it is? Think about what they wear. They wear slickers, they wear coats. So imagine if I'm going butt to the front, or butt to the back, excuse me, and I'm trying to get to my gun fast, and I've got this slicker, this coat in the way, because it's cold up here. To get this out of the way, it would get caught in the, the coat and stuff. So they're like, this is not working. So they would pull it up closer to the front. Just move the belt. Okay. And they would go butts to the front, and then they would do a cross draw like this because they could get it out of their coat faster. So this was something the Midwest used. And you will have to identify these on your test, these little gun tricks, by the way. So this is the cross draw. Butts to the front, cross draw. Let's talk about, like, I get in a duel. I'm going one-on-one, -on -one, Doc Holliday versus Johnny Ringo. All right? All right, first of all, you have to know that, again, they were doing anything they could to get an advantage. Now, of course, these are toy gun holsters. I don't have a real one. Does anybody have a real one at home? Could you bring one for us, Heather? It, well, is that allowed? Or would your family not want you to? Okay. Do you have one, Ryan? I have, but they just want a lot of metal. That's okay. If you can just bring a holster so we can feel the leather, okay? Think of it like any of you play baseball or softball. You know how your glove feels, right? That's what their holsters felt like, and they were made of leather, and they would shape those suckers just like you do your baseball glove. What do you do to shape your baseball glove, baseball players? You put a baseball in it, then what do you do? Soak it and hold it. Soak it in what? So you tie it together with twine. Do you do anything to it before or after that? What do you do with your glove? What? You fit it. You grease it down, right? Good. We'll pick up there tomorrow. See you then. Okay, where's my thing? <laughs> 